ahead. My name is Natalie Forlett. I am the Director for Partnerships and Member Engagement with Campus Compact. So I know some folks are familiar with Campus Compact and some people are familiar with Every Campus of Refuge. So um, Campus Compact is a membership organization for colleges and universities that work on civic engagement initiatives. So we really help our members to try and deepen their engagement with their communities and also think of ways to really help graduate students who are going to be um, engaged and active citizens. Uh, this conversation is sort of a, a continuation of something we started last year. So as um, the war in Ukraine was unfolding, we held a coalition conversation about how campuses were engaging or reacting to that. Uh, and we had Daya as one of our speakers to talk about sort of refugee um, action and how campuses are involved in that work. So we were really excited to be able to bring Daya back to kind of introduce some more uh, in-depth work of, of how campuses are working uh, with refugees and what that looks like across the country. So I'm going to hand it to Daya and thank her and all of our speakers for being here today. Thank you so much, Natalie. And hi, everybody. Um, we love seeing you. It's okay if you don't want to have um, your cameras on, uh, but do introduce yourself in the chat as folks are filtering in. It would be great to know who's with us. I see Stacy already. Hi, Stacy. Um, please put your name and affiliation. We'd love to know where you are and where you're um, Zooming from today. I'm very excited to be here with a group of wonderful people, and I will um, introduce them very shortly. Um, thank you to Natalie and to Campus Compact. Um, as Natalie said, this uh, panel today is a partnership between Campus Compact and Every Campus a Refuge. Every Campus a Refuge is an organization that really started as a college initiative um, in 2015 at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, with the idea that colleges and universities can act as co-sponsors and resettlement sites for newcomers to our um, to our country and, and uh, specifically refugees. Um, our mission as an organization, we became uh, a nonprofit in 2017, our mission is to mobilize colleges and universities across the country to host refugees on campus grounds, support them in their integration, all while transforming the experiences of the campus community, especially the students. Um, the initiative has grown, uh, thankfully, since then, and, and we have a lot of partners across this country who are engaging in this space. Um, this particular uh, panel will focus on that, on that effort of um, higher education supporting refugee resettlement and integration with uh, over 100 million individuals displaced and less than 1% of the 27 million human beings who are designated as refugees set to resettle, and that number is always staggering, right, that there's less than 1% of refugees will ever resettle. Um, Every Campus a Refuge asked eight years ago, what role can higher education play in supporting the resettlement and integration of refugees? Um, after significant decimation to the refugee resettlement program and infrastructure um, between 2018 and 2020, this question really became even more pressing after the evacuation of nearly 80,000 um, Afghan um, individuals to the US and then of course the war in Ukraine. A lot of higher education institutions at the time stepped up to support Afghan evacuees either as students or scholars or as newcomers to the community. Today, nearly a year in after many higher education institutions have stepped up to support Afghan evacuees, we really wanna hear from folks on this panel who represent both higher education institutions, public and private, as well as an organization supporting higher education in, um, institutions about their experiences, the lessons learned, and their key takeaways. Um, I want to start by um, introducing our panelists quickly um, by name and affiliation and then have them talk a little bit, give us a broad overview of their work, who they are, and what uh, and what they're doing um, in this space. So um, let's start off with um, Randy Kluver at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Kluver. Hi, everybody. It's a delight to be here. Uh, I am Randy Kluver. I'm at Oklahoma State in Stillwater, Oklahoma. A little bit of background. We're a community of about 50,000 people in Stillwater. Um, a university of about 25,000, and we are a public land-grant university. Um, Dia, was, was I supposed to go ahead and launch in at this point, or are you going to go through all the introductions first? Let's do the introductions first, and then we'll come back okay. to you, Randy. Thank you. Very Wonderful. Uh, Neela, can you please introduce yourself and, and your position? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's so nice uh, to, to be here. I don't see everyone, but nice seeing you. Um, my name is Nele Feldman. I am currently an advisor at the Community Sponsorship Hub and specifically focused on the role that universities and colleges can play in privately sponsoring refugee students on their campuses. Thank you, Nila. And Shelley Calabresi from Russell Sage. Hi everyone, um, for STIA and Campus Compact, thank you so much for inviting me here today to this conversation. I'm really honored to, to be a part of it. Um, I'm Shelley Calabrese, Executive Director of the Women's Institute at Russell Sage College. Wonderful, thank you. So Randy, we'll go back to you. Um, we'd love to hear about, just if you can give us an overview of, of, of your work specifically and then broadly with Afghan evacuees. Sure, um, I am the, uh... Associate Provost and Dean of OSU Global, which means I oversee the international activities, the university, including study abroad, international students, the intensive English program, and all the things that are normally associated with that. Uh, we, um, what happened is our community got quite uh, engaged when Afghanistan fell in August of 2021. And uh, we had a number of faculty and, and folks asking us, alumni particularly, what, what will the university do in response? Well, we didn't really have a plan. Um, we were asked you know, by a number of our alumni to, to find ways to help bring people out of Afghanistan, but we didn't have a, a key mechanism for doing that. Uh, it was later that fall though, uh, about September, October, that we heard that Stillwater had been chosen to receive a number of the Afghan evacuees which was surprising for us because Stillwater has never received uh, refugees in any form that we were familiar with. And so Catholic Charities of Eastern Oklahoma had the responsibility for settling them. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're a small community of about 50, maybe 55,000 people. And so we don't have the resources of a, a lot of larger cities. We certainly didn't have a refugee resettlement agency. And so what we did is we offered to Catholic Charities that we could provide some empty graduate student housing, which was housing that was already set aside for our international students. There were a number of facilities associated with that, including a family resource center, which was already on campus dedicated to helping international families uh, make their way in our community. Uh, a transportation network, a citywide transportation network. And so um, our work began really just trying to meet a very basic need of housing. Uh, because of COVID, you might remember a lot of campus storms were empty, and, and, and including ours, we had a lot of empty spaces. And so uh, we were able to negotiate a deal between Catholic Charities and Oklahoma State to house up to 15 families in university housing. And then they began arriving in the, um, the uh, fall of uh, 21 and then uh, January of 22. It quickly progressed beyond that. Uh, in ways that we hadn't anticipated. Um, our building, which is the uh, West Watkins Center, the, uh, is the Center for International Activity on our campus, we began to offer intensive English classes uh, for those who were coming in. And because we had a lot of people with small children, then we would also create some opportunities for childcare and a number of other things. And so we really became a host for about 70 Afghans who came to our city. Um, some of them, most of them were housed in campus housing, a number of them were off campus, but we became the center for all of it because we were offering English lessons. Out of the English lessons, we began to offer a number of other things. For example, because we had everybody together three times a week for English, it made it pretty easy for us to become the center for uh, legal consultation, for vision consultation for uh, medical consultation. And so our, our really our, our building became a center for all kinds of activities related to this. Finally, in the spring of 2022, um, when we found out the Catholic Charities 90 day obligation to the Department of State was up, as I mentioned, there was no other agency left to um, really oversee the, the wraparound services, the other services that the uh, Afghan evacuees would be entitled to. And so we worked with the State Department of Human uh, Health, Human Services and, and others to say, well, maybe we can step into this role. And so what we ended up doing is hiring a few case managers, uh, one full-time, two part-time to continue that effort. And the state was able to provide some funding for us that allowed us 
A, to, to launch a really comprehensive English program that included not just English, but also all the other issues associated with uh, settling in the U.S., how to get a driver's license, how to find a job, how to write a resume, and, and all of those kinds of issues. Um, and so that's where we are today. We've been um, engaged in this for almost a year and a half. Um, it's been uh, pretty consuming. It's we we one of the reasons we 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 did it though, and and I, I really like the mission of Campus Compact, is it was a service to our community. Uh, we're a small city that did not have the resources, but the university was able to to step in and really ramp up the activity for this. So I'll stop there, Dia, and perhaps we can come back for some other things later. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, Shelley, can I go to you if you can give us a brief overview of um, your role and the work at Russell Sage College? Sure. Um, first, I thought it would be important just to kind of give an overview of the history of the college. Um, we were actually founded in 1916 by Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage, and we were founded as an all women's college. Um, and in 2020, we had to make the tough decision to go co-ed, which is how the Women's Institute came about. Um, the Institute's a place where we honor our legacy and our history as a women's college, and we continue to give women and underserved communities opportunities um, where they had none before. So we officially launched in the fall of 2020, and one of my first goals as executive director was to create a strategic plan um, from scratch. So I looked at our history, um, which is really deeply rooted in fostering a commitment to service, and I decided to start there. Um, in fact, our founder's philosophy was, if you're in a position to help, you have a responsibility help. So that really resonated with me um, and something that I kept in the back of my mind as I developed the plan, um, which, you know, again, after a lot of research, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more as we continue the conversation, um, this eventually led to us becoming the first ECAR chapter in New York State in early 2021. Thank you so much, Shelley, and we look forward to hearing about all the ways that you've supported um, Afghan folks in, in Albany and Troy, and especially Afghan women. Uh, Neela, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dio. The Community Sponsorship Hub does not go back qu quite that long. Um, so, so also a, a brief history. The Community Sponsorship Hub was founded in September 2021, really with a mission to grow the role of communities in the protection, resettlement, and integration of refugees and forcibly displaced people in communities across the United States. Um, we are the first organization that is really dedicated to growing the role of community sponsorship in the United States. Um, and our goal is to connect community partners at the national and local levels with the knowledge and the resources that they need to ensure that they have the capacity to welcome and integrate newcomers and set them up to thrive in their new environment. So really, you know, a lot of what Randy and Shelley said resonated. Um, the launch of the Community Sponsorship Hub coincided with the fall of Kabul. So again, we heard a lot about Afghanistan already. Uh, we were not founded because of the fall of Kabul. But again, you can imagine that we got quite busy really quickly. And in coordination with the Department of State and the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, PRM, um, CSH headed a, a fairly big consortium of organizations, including a lot of wonderful resettlement partners, to launch the Sponsor Circle program for Afghans. And that program allowed, because as you, as you all know, because you have experienced it yourself, resettlement um, organizations were really overwhelmed with a number of Afghans coming to the United States all at the same time. So for the first time, um, the, the Department of State basically allowed for private sponsors to welcome these individuals if they opted to do so, to be resettled by private sponsors in their communities. So it really allowed a group of five to take over those uh, integration um, responsibilities for, for Afghans that were evacuated from um, Afghanistan. So 
overall, the Sponsor Circle program supported 601 individuals over a fairly short amount of time. And I think what is really excited about that, it was the first proof of, well, maybe not the first, but it was in a long time, the first proof of concept in the US that showed that private sponsorship is possible, that Americans across the country are eager to welcome newcomers in their communities and that they really want to do something. And I'm gonna talk about this later um, in today's discussion. It was also a very important proof of concept for, for launching private sponsorship in the United States, which again, I know that many of you know this, but on January 19th, um, the US government did launch Welcome Corps, which again is a, a really innovative way to expand the resettlement capacity in the US and does allow for private sponsorship. Thank you so much, Neela. Um, Randy, if I can go back to you and, and ask, what prompted you to engage your campus in refugee resettlement and integration? You talked a little bit about sort of the call from the community, right? But I, I know you and I know your personal story. So I'm really, I would love folks to hear about your own experience, your own personal experience, and then perhaps to speak a little bit more about um, what else from the campus or the community prompted you to do this work. Yeah, thanks for that, that question. Um, I do have a personal history going back uh, to the 1970s uh, when uh, South Vietnam fell in 1975, my parents decided they wanted to do something to uh, help in that effort. We ended up uh, doing private sponsorship of Vietnamese refugees to my small town in Western Oklahoma. It was an even smaller community of about 8,000 people, a small farming and ranching community. And it was one of those programs that just grew. Uh, we, we decided to sponsor one family and then um, it just kind of grew from there. It, it ended up being several hundred individuals, about 250 individuals ended up coming to that small town. And so this was, I was fairly young. I was 12 to 13, 14 years old at this point. And so it radically transformed how I understood refugees. I'd never heard of the word refugee before. I didn't know what that meant. But all of a sudden, I was surrounded with them, and they were my best friends. Um, that had a deep impact on my thinking about the needs and the stories and, and what people were bringing to that experience. One of the things, though, that I took from that, and, and again, I was fairly young, so I wasn't very sophisticated at the time, but we brought in so many Vietnamese refugees to that community, but they didn't last very long. Um, most of them within about a year moved uh, to larger communities, California, Texas, and so on and so forth. And one of the reasons that they moved is they weren't set up to succeed. They didn't have the English language skills, there weren't the jobs, and, and there weren't the opportunities available. So, so really very rapidly, uh, that, that population emptied out and moved to larger communities. That really drove much of our thinking about how we would do this in Stillwater, because we wanted them to be not only successful in the U.S., but we wanted them to feel welcome to our community. We wanted them to have all the tools they needed. And we talked often with community leadership about seeing these folks not as needy, but as potential resources and future citizens of the city. And so that really drove much of our approach. Uh, it prompted us to focus immediately on English language education. So our experience in the 70s is we had one volunteer teacher who would, would come over for an hour a week to teach whoever wanted English. Um, and so that's not enough when you have that many people. So what we did instead is we said we want everybody to be engaged in, in full time English language education. And so because I do oversee an English language institute an intensive English program here at Oklahoma State, we were able to quickly pivot to really offer a full set of English language at multiple levels. So we had some people who had some English, we had some people who didn't have any. And so we really, it, it prioritized our thinking. Um, we also knew that employment was an issue. So we began really working with employers in the community very quickly to, to get people into jobs so that they would feel like they were, um, they were making a contribution to their own um, family's welfare. And so that's really the personal history. Um, it was a, we were able to tie it in because we are a land grant university and, and many people have heard me say this all the time, but a land grant university is about access and it's about serving the community. 
And we were able to talk with our university leadership and get support from, from throughout the university because we talked about how important this was and, and how the resources of the university really could make a difference in this, this really um, important time for our community. Thank you, Randy. Um, I really, really appreciate that insight about what kind of infrastructure you need to have to be able to retain newcomers into your community. Otherwise, you lose them, obviously, to other parts of the of the country. And um, it's heartening to hear that that that's not what you didn't want that to happen in Stillwater. And it's wonderful. I, we know that most of the folks that you're hosting are still there a year in. So we'll hear about that a little bit later. Um, Shelley, same question to you. What what prompted you to start this work? Sure. Um, so the Women's Institute, we really value practice over theory, and our goal is to provide a framework and strategies for social change. That's our platform. So I was already aware of the fantastic work that my colleague and our director of service learning, Ali Schaefing, was doing, along with her students at our local refugee welcome center. And I realized there was an incredible opportunity there for us to partner and expand on the work. So I had been doing some research on refugee resettlement um, and I came across the ECAR initiative and it really, it just clicked for me. I thought you know, to myself, this is it. This is how we're gonna make an even bigger impact on our community. So I got really excited. I immediately reached out to Allie to tell her about ECAR and I could tell she was just as excited um, as me and saw the same potential as I did, um, which is what ultimately led me to build ECAR into the Women's Institute strategic plan. Um, on a personal note, this is really new work for me and I'm really grateful um, to be in a position where I can make this part of the work that I do at Russell Sage College. I really, um, you know, obviously I knew about refugees um, in a kind of a broad way before this, but it wasn't until I really started talking to Allie about the work that she was doing that I had a, a better understanding and um, felt a desire to, to make a difference. So um, again, really grateful that, you know, I could build that into what we do here at the Women's Institute. And obviously it aligns very well with your mission in the same way that it aligns very well with the mission of a land grant university. Um, Neela, can you tell us a little bit about why the Community Sponsorship Hub was founded? You spoke to that a little bit and you know, just maybe a little bit more about its mission. Yeah, I mean, again, really the, the mission of the Community Sponsorship Hub is to ensure that we capacitate as many Americans as possible. And what I mean by that is, is not only citizens, so you know, people who, who live in this country to support newcomers in their communities. And that's not only refugees, but also other forcibly displaced persons. And again, I think it goes back to the long history of welcome that the United States has, right? So there's a lot of, um, currently there's a lot of partisan conversations when we talk about immigration and migration. But again, what we have seen in our work, what um, really most of our staff has seen that if you talk on a, on a human level, on a person level, people do want to connect. And that really goes across party lines. And that really goes across, um, you know, sort of the, the partisan rhetoric. And especially what we have seen with the Sponsor Circle program, we have sponsor circles in more than 35 states. And obviously, as you can imagine, those are states that are more conservative leaning, more liberal leaning, rural, um, you know, more urban centers. The same as all of your universities and campuses. They are very different environments all across the United States. But again, what we see over and over again, if you do give people an opportunity to support, to help, to have that connection at the human level. They of course need support, they need resources, they need you know, that experience, that knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of challenges that of course go along with uh, sponsoring refugees. I think we're gonna talk about that a little more, right? Like really on, on the day-to-day -day level. But again, as an organization, we deeply believe that everyone can play a role in resettlement, either as a, as a direct and active sponsor or as someone who sort of 
working you know, with an immigrant serving organization, um, volunteering in-kind donations, other donations as an advocate. So again, we just wanna increase awareness of the ways that everyone can get engaged in this work and um, that it's also, that it's not, I think really importantly, not charity, but also the benefits to the hosting communities, right? The benefits to the sponsors, really sort of the life-changing experiences, despite the challenges that go along with sponsorship that I think um, the vast majority of the people that we are working with have when they interact with newcomers. Thank you so much, Neela. And I, this is a great way to segue into um, our next question is that there is a lot of rhetoric that's that's really polarizing, right, about about refugees. My question to to Shelley and and then Randy is the same question. Um, both of you are doing work that is very directly supporting refugee and refugee integration, whether it's by offering housing. In both of your cases, you're hosting Afghan evacuees on campus-owned housing. You're offering a lot of services, a lot of support. How have you navigated some of the challenges um, around refugee support? Um, especially, how have you uh, really built community buy-in? How did you get folks to support you in this work and, and to buy in and to, um, to walk with you? Um, Shelly, let's start with you and then we'll go to Randy. Sure. Um, there were a couple of strategies um, that we had to foster community buy-in. Um, first, as I mentioned before, was the strategic plan. The Women's Institute strategic plan was a really big one. It had to be approved by the president of the college and also voted on at an annual board of trustees meeting, um, which I'm very proud to say there was 100% support from our board, which really made a huge difference. And um, in addition to the president and the board's buy-in, the partnership that we have with our Office of Service Learning really was a key element to our success in implementing ECAR. We had students already interested in this type of work and the service learning program really provided a, a perfect framework um, to support those efforts. I think we're gonna talk about one of your students a little bit later, I always carry that. I belong in Albany. Oh, I, I take it with me everywhere I go, by the way. Neela has seen it. Randy, everybody's seen it. Uh, Randy, same question to you. How did you get the community to support? Um, you know, I think we have a lot of stereotypes about certain communities. Um, and you said that Stillwater had never received necessarily refugees in this way before. Um, mm -hmm. How did you get the community to support you? You know, our, our experience was a little different from Shelley's in, in that we didn't have to go for high level approval at first. Um, what we did is we built it in as we were going and, and it, because it started as a, as a fairly simple, uh, really business transaction, right? You've got some empty housing. We've got people we'd like to put in there. Would you do that? And, and so I was able to negotiate that with, you know, people at the director of housing and so on and so forth. And we were able to move forward on that. But from the very beginning, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew what was happening. And we, um, so, so we did a little bit of a media blitz, and we, it's not that we tried to do it, it's that it came to us, because although we're a small community, we're, we're in the two flagship universities in our state, so everybody knows about Oklahoma State University, and so once news stations, for example, out of Oklahoma City or Tulsa heard about it, they started running stories on it, um, because in my previous life, I was actually a media studies scholar, I knew how important it was to really control the narrative, and so we worked with the outlets, the newspapers, the statewide newspapers to make sure that the story was represented well and not poorly. Um, I spent a tremendous amount of time with community groups, with faculty council, with our university senior leadership, and with parents because we had a lot of uh, parents who felt, why are you bringing terrorists to our campus who are gonna endanger our sons and daughters? And so I spent a lot of time talking with people, um, but we just spent a significant amount of time telling the story, making sure that, that things um, went well. We, we still spend quite a bit of time uh, making sure that people are understanding what's happening. I'll give you an example, and Dia, you have not heard this, but there are two families in our city who have uh, gotten a lot of attention lately because they're panhandling on the streets. And because of their dress, everyone assumes they're Afghan. They're not Afghan. 
they're from Eastern Europe, but everyone assumes they're Afghans. And so on the community Facebook group and, and a lot of those kinds of things, there's all this stuff about the Afghans have now come to exploit us and are now begging on the streets. So we're having to spend a lot of time talking about, well, you know, in fact, these are people who are not part of our effort. All of our people are still engaged in employment and they're still learning English and, and this is not that. But so there is a lot of um, attention to it. Uh, we do spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, I've talked, you know, everybody from the faculty council to the emeritus faculty council to the local rotary clubs. Um, we spend a lot of time with local faith groups helping them to understand what's happening um, because there's a lot of interest there in helping. Um, so we spend quite a bit of time communicating. And um, th that's, that's I, I think, one of the things that we've done well. I, um, I, I love something that you say that I frequently quote, which is that most people, when you have a conversation with them, they become pretty reasonable and they get it, right? That yeah. more often than not, that's really what it takes is having a conversation with somebody because there's so much misinformation out there. There's so much um, mystery out there about just refugees and the refugee experience. And, and um, you know, you're educating a lot of people by having those conversations. Um, no, that's exactly right. You might remember that a, a, about January of 22, there was a widely reported news story that an Afghan refugee had assaulted uh, an American military officer in Minnesota, I think it was. And that was everybody knew that everybody knew that these people were dangerous and, and so on and so forth. And, I, you know, I think it's a much more complicated story than that. But that's what people were responding to in January, February and March of 22 mm -hmm. of of thinking that, you know, we don't know who these people are. Of course, there was a political story that, that was being uh, really broadcast across the nation that they were unvetted um, and therefore unsafe. And so, you know, we, we spent a tremendous amount of time and I would talk with uh, parents of our students who would call and, and the students had actually never encountered any of the Afghans, uh, but I'd spend an hour. And, you know, for me to spend an hour on a phone call with somebody, it's, it's a big commitment. But it was that important to us that that people understood what we were doing. And, and Dia, as you say, most people, once they understood what we were doing, uh, became reasonable and said, OK, well, you know, I'm still not sure I like what you're doing, but I, I have confidence that you're hearing me. And so that was a really important thing. Thank you, Randy. Um, Neela, one of the things that you mentioned earlier is the huge benefits to communities that sponsorship brings. So if I can uh, start with you on this particular question, what, what are some of the ways in which engaging in this work has transformed either sponsored refugees or communities that you know of, campuses that you know of? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to hear some of those experiences that you've heard and that you're privy to about the transformation and the benefits. Yeah, and I mean, I will say that I come from sort of like I, I, I at some point transitioned into more of the resettlement world before I was more working directly in the high education world, working for the Institute of International Education, um, leading their programs on displaced and refugee students. So again, working with a lot of Syrian students. And then I eventually became very interested in sort of the intersection between high education and resettlement. So all to say, I think I'm going to pull from both experiences, if, if that makes sense. Um, starting more with resettlement experience, and it's also a little bit based on my personal experience. I think for communities, regardless if it's at a campus or you know just like a broader community in the country, I do think that of course as a sponsor and as a university supporting students um, or families, of course, you give, as Randy just said, you do give a lot of your time, you do give a lot of, you know, sort of in-kind and financial resources. So, of course, there's, quote unquote, a lot of giving. But I think um, what we all need to do is sort of shift that narrative a little bit to also the just the benefits that we all as individuals, as campuses and as communities get out of, quote unquote, get out of, um, you know, hosting refugee populations in our communities and, and our campuses. So, Really going back to my experience at IAE, I still, for full disclosure, I'm very biased. My husband's Syrian, we did meet in Syria. So of course I have a strong um, connection to, to that part of the world. But all to say that I think we met so many, at IAE I met so many just fabulous, intelligent and wonderful students who did, despite my personal connection to the country, 
did teach me so much about sort of their own struggles, right? Their own family struggles, like aspects of the Syrian conflict that, that I even wasn't able to sort of keep up with. Um, in those personal conversations, I became so much more aware of the multiple challenges that they were facing integrating. It was not, quote unquote, only the language or the, um, you know, the higher, the different higher education system, but also I haven't heard a better expression for that. But the survivor guild, they were here, their families were still back there. So just and, and then on the very practical level, I think um, what we take for granted the grocery shopping, the applying for benefits. Um, I think there is a quite humbling element for sponsors, you know, be it in a more official or sort of volunteering capacity and just recognizing how difficult our systems are in the United States, especially if you don't come as a student, for example, on an F1, despite you being potentially from a displaced background, if you have a family of, let's say, five or six, and you have to ensure that they um, sign up and receive all of the benefits that they're entitled to, it does take a lot of time. There's very little resources on that. It's very different from state to state. It's different from county to county. So again, I do think that it's a quite humbling experience for Americans as well to recognize how difficult our systems are to navigate, to recognize, to Dia's point, there's so much misinformation, right? There is sort of this, this narrative of the refugees come and they get everything and the red carpet is rolled out and they really don't. Um, sponsorship is, is 90 days, right? Support from, from agencies is 90 days. There's, of course, additional programs that then, you know, add to the 90 days, but but it really isn't a scenario where they're just sort of like battered on roses. So again, I also do think that it just creates a lot of empathy within communities. And I think what is, and I'm going to make that, I could go on and on. I will make that the last point, Dia. From our perspective at the Community Sponsorship Hub, and again, I think this is true for sort of the campus ecosystem and then the broader community system, what it really allows campuses and communities is to strengthen their on and off campus connections. So like over and over again, I've been working with institutions who said, well, we actually had never talked to, you know, department XYZ, but now we have those relationships and we can actually use those relationships, not only for our display students, but also for our domestic students, for our international students. They reached out to their local communities, to businesses, for internship opportunities, for additional funding opportunities, um, to sort of, you know, I, one of my favorite examples uh, was in Evansville, Indiana, again, not one of the communities that might be known for being the most welcoming community to refugees and displaced populations. They had over 30 Syrians on campus and they would go to the high schools and they would talk to the high school students, which again, I think is just like a, a, a really a great way to break down stereotypes and you can read as many articles as you want you can you know watch as many sort of documentaries as you want nothing will ever replace that in-person interaction so also really being mindful about the relationships that we as sponsors make within our communities and have access to even after sponsorship right and same for campuses all of the relationships all of the sort of interactions that may have not been there previously but by participating and launching such an initiative on campus you are able to really bring the campus together and really strengthen those interdepartmental relationships thank you nila um i want to give 10 minutes for q a so um we will answer we'll try to answer maybe one more question over the next um five minutes but i do want randy and shelly to address this question of how working with alongside refugees has benefited your campus in maybe very specific ways and also benefited the the refugees that you're hosting in very specific ways so Shelley let's let's start with you maybe a couple of examples that you've seen sure um one of the biggest benefits I've seen is the sense of community that really comes from doing this kind of work you really become kind of a family um sharing in life's good and challenging moments um, we recently, uh, our group of volunteers, our SAGE team of volunteers had lunch at one of the families we, we sponsor at their home. And it was a really interesting conversation. Um, that, you know, the mom of the family was saying how when they came here, 
their family back in Afghanistan was really worried about them being here alone. And she said, no, not to worry. I have all of these wonderful people. I have this family here now. So that um, has been a huge benefit, I think, to all of us. Um, and also, uh, you know, just talking with one another, spending time with one another, I think it really helps us, you know, broaden our world view. Um, and it makes a big, big difference in our ability to, to be better global citizens. Um, also being an ECAR chapter has really given our students a unique opportunity um, to explore how they can make an impact. We actually had one of our classes this year um, decide to take on a project to develop an I Belong coloring book for refugee children. Um, so it was a great project. The students had to develop a plan write up a funding proposal and present it to me, the Women's Institute, um, which was a really great learning exercise, particularly for the future fundraisers in the class. Um, also one of the students who worked um, on the project did all of the, the graphic design work. Um, so I'm not sure if we can see this. I think there's a picture of it. Uh, at the end. Um, yeah, so. there is a picture. And when you have that background, things don't show. But yes, yeah. we do have a picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so it's a beautiful I belong in. And in this case, Albany, that's, you know, the, the main hub um, for refugee resettlement in our area. And it has all of these kind of iconic images from around the city of Albany, including, you know, uh, Washington Park or the New York State Museum or even you know, the, the buses they would drive, Capital District Transit Authority, CDTA buses. So it was really created to, to help um, the kids feel like this is their community and I, I belong here. Um, so that was a really incredible project that um, our students took on and the Women's Institute was really um, pleased to be able to fund, fund the project. Um, and I've also seen some of the volunteers, student volunteers um, that have been working, uh, you know, in this space become so inspired um, that they really want to continue with the work after college and some are even considering careers in, in human rights and law. Um, so it, it's been a huge benefit in, in so many, so many different ways. Thank you so much, Shelley. Randy, it's the same question to you, and I'm hoping we can hear about some of the folks that you're that you're hosting and where they are right now and what they're doing. Yeah, um, you know, we're a pretty large state institution of 24, 25,000. So the, the reality is most of our faculty, most of our students have never met uh, any of our Afghan guests. And so, you know, I, I can't say there's been a, a marked change in the campus climate, but for those who have engaged, it's been really transformative. Uh, like Shelley, we do have a, a graduate program focused on global studies that is really focused on things like uh, global development, forced migration. And so for those students who were engaged, it really became transformative. It was an opportunity for them to, to engage directly and not just theoretically and, and really gain that experience. And so in our building, there's no doubt it's been transformative. Has it impacted our athletics department? Probably not. But in, the, in a way, that's a good thing. They were they came into our community. They were part of it. There was no real disruption, and and they've been welcomed in our community. We are proud of how many have have moved on. Um, we've now got this semester four enrolled at tech, er, at Oklahoma State University. Two at the graduate level. Two at the undergraduate level. We expect that number to double next year. We're doing everything we can to provide scholarships and fellowships and assistantships and so on to make it affordable for folks. But one of the things that has been, you know, a goal from the very beginning, I mentioned the English, but one of the other goals was that um, that the, the kids who came knew that they wanted to go to Oklahoma State University eventually. Now, we thought that would play out over five to 12 years. In fact, it played out immediately because people immediately started enrolling, but it's been fantastic. And we, we are proud of one particular child as a part of our community who, who arrived here a year ago, not speaking a word of English in September of 2022, less than a year, really less than half a year after he arrived, he was named the outstanding citizen of the junior high that he attends. And, you know, that's a remarkable story. 
Um, and so folks have done well. Um, not everybody, it's still a struggle, particularly if, if they came. Um, the Dari speakers have done very well. The Pasho speakers, it's been a little more difficult. The more formal education they had when they arrived, the easier it was. Um, and, you know, we've, I'm not to, I, I don't want to make it seem like everything's been rosy because it hasn't. It's been very difficult. We've had to deal with issues of abuse and issues of, of resource stretching and, and people who had a really hard time finding adequate jobs. Um, but most uh, overall, I think it's gone quite well and we're very proud of, of the accomplishments of everyone who's arrived here. Thank you, Randy. I want to open up the space um, for questions from folks on the call. Um, and I do want to come back to Neela at some point to talk about sort of the future, future engagement for universities in this space. But if you have a question that you'd like to put in the chat, go ahead. Otherwise, if you raise your hand, you'll, I'll see you. You'll, you'll come to the top of my, um, my screen and, and uh, you can ask your question. Uh, Zakia, yes. Uh, I'm like, I don't know, I'm wondering whether it's the right question to ask or not the, from Randy, as he's shared as a, the experience from like how they, like how they process the Afghan like trauma or whatever, like the stereotype. And I'm wondering whether as a student, because I'm an Afghan student, like what do you recommend or suggestion? What about like when they inside the class, you're doing so good, but how you recommend, what do you recommend that how to avoid those stereotype as a student because I noticed like that there are some students they are directly under even the professors sometimes they underestimate you directly and you feel that and what's your suggestion and how as a youth and what we can do to avoid those things and make it clear things for those I, I know that it's hard to finish that stereotype but as I kind of decrease the limit yeah I think you have a lot of questions embedded in that. And so let me let me um, sort of, you know, folks did bring a lot of trauma with them. And so we tried to make very uh, careful, we, we tried to be very careful that everything we engage with took into account that trauma. We weren't always successful, but even the English classes, we tried to, to do that. Um, rather than asking the children, for example, to immediately go to the elementary school, with absolutely no preparation. The elementary school came to our building and spent three weeks. They, they sent three teachers up here for three weeks just to work with the children to help them learn how does an American school work and, and what's expected of you. And, and, and really, it was more of a playtime. But, but at that point, when, this, when the students were ready to go to the elementary school, they were ready. They felt like they knew the teachers. They felt like they knew what the rules were. And so um, once they got to the school, it was pretty easy for them to adapt, and, and, and they became very happy and succeeded very well, and of course, learned English very well. So taking into account how to really um, make this a, an, an easier experience than, than normal, we often reminded people, look, the, the, the folks who have come to our, our city had their country ripped out from underneath them. They've left behind family members, they've left behind possessions, they've left behind you know, meaningful jobs, and now you're asking them to go to work in a fast food restaurant. And so we reminded people there's, there's, there's a lot that's been given up. So you know, let's work as, as much as we can to help them. Um, and in the same way, you know, as, as you mentioned, I, I, you mentioned that you're a student, you know, our students who have enrolled, it's been a, a challenge for them. Even if they had formal uh, higher education in Afghanistan, it's an adjustment to a, a very different uh, um, setting and, and different academic expectations. But I think, uh, and, and I haven't heard all the trauma stories, I'm sure, maybe not everybody's sharing everything with me, but I think by and large, because there was a lot of communication about it, even if people did not know or meet any of the Afghans, they had heard about it. And so they were sensitized to it. And so the faculty were proud of the fact that we were on the news station and, and talking about our partnership in this effort. And so I think our faculty really bent over backwards. I will say that a lot of our faculty went way, way so far. They just became so giving and so, you know, so much a part of the effort. And 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 I don't want to end this call without giving thanks to Ecar and, and Dia. She reached out to me early in this effort and says, um, hey, 
she didn't say it quite this bluntly, but you don't know what you're doing, but I could perhaps give you some guidance. And uh, that was exactly what we needed. And so it was, it was, it was really, really appreciated. Thank you. It was not meant, definitely not meant in that spirit. <laughs> it was, y'all are amazing. How can I be a part of it? Um, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, one more question. If there is, if there is one, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Or as folks formulate that question, I'm going to have Neela speak. Um, so the last question I want to ask, which is, what are the ways, Neela, that campuses can engage in refugee resettlement integration support, and why are they ideal sites for community sponsorship and co-sponsorship? And I'm going to give you two minutes. And then Stacy has a question, so maybe one minute. <laughs> one minute. Okay. Well, <laughs> Dia can Dia can really give you like a really nice virtual representation of all the ways a, a campus can engage in in resettlement. And again, there's of course the co-sponsorship model, right? Which is the ECAR model, where a group of volunteers works really closely with their local resettlement agency or local affiliate. Um, and again, I mean, I have a very specific um, job, I guess, but it but it doesn't mean that there is only one way to engage for institutions. I think it really can be a variety of ways, depending on your size, your location, your resources, your mission, whatever it might be. I think what we are very excited about, I talked about private sponsorship, is really the possibility of universities becoming private sponsors. When I say universities, I don't necessarily mean the institution, but really stakeholders on campus, the whole campus ecosystem together to privately sponsor specifically refugee students. Again, not saying that there's not other ways to do this. And what Dia said, and I mean, everyone has been saying this sort of like in their responses. Um, I, I think, Randy, you listed a number of services that were either already available or it wasn't the it was still a lift. I'm not going to say it wasn't a lift, but you know, it, it was, you, you were able to do it. So it's in, if you look at the resettlement services um, for refugees, it does include English language learning. It does include housing. It does include transportation. Um, it includes sort of the cultural connection. So a lot of that is anyway already happening on campuses. And I think what I a lot of times say when I, um, you know, listen to wonderful faculty and staff as yourself is there is students where you know, not every single student will want to work and engage with refugee populations. But I'm pretty sure that at most campuses, you will find a group of, you know, a handful of students who are really eager to have this opportunity to directly engage with refugee families, refugee uh, students, and do some of the work that, that maybe staff and faculty does not have the, the time and capacity for. And that, you know, sounds very um, simple to us. We mentioned it before, the grocery shopping, the applying for a social security card, the, you know, getting located, knowing where the, where the doctor's office is. There are so many, there are so many items and things that, that newcomers have to navigate. And again, it might sound really trivial to us, but for them, it might be like a, a whole day or two that it takes them to figure it out. And so much of this work can be taken over by, by students and can be led by students. And it's really sort of a two-way street where both the newcomers benefit and, and, and the campuses and the students benefit. And we think that for those reasons, we wanna see universities and colleges all across the United States big, small, private, public, rural, you know, urban, in the more conservative states or liberal states, we would love to see this movement of institutions who say, yes, we can step up as private sponsors and we can host one, five, 20, however many, you know, institutions might be able to support refugee students on our campuses. And my last thing is that of course, what we see as a great benefit is that these students would come not on humanitarian parole, not on F1 student visas, but would come as officially resettled refugees, meaning that they, um, you know, will be on track to a permanent residency and, and uh, citizenship, which again, I'm sure everyone working with displaced populations who are on a less um, permanent status know how much of a challenge that can be. Dia, I know it was more than a minute. But Thank so. you. <laughs> Stacy. go ahead, ask your question. Thank you, Neela, that was wonderful. So my question is for those folks that are from um, universities in particular on the call. Um, at Church World Service, uh, we're one of the resettlement agencies uh, that functions as a national resettlement agency um, across the country and have 
38 offices located all across the country. Um, we do a few different opportunities throughout the year. One is a college welcome week that we host in coordination with Welcoming, Amer Welcoming America, where we have professors from, in the past it's been Princeton, Columbia, University of Michigan, Georgetown, um, uh, Guilford, and others um, come on and speak. And we've always really struggled with who is the best point of contact at the university to reach out to, to tell them about events that are happening that college students can plug into. So like social events or like learning opportunities, but then also, for our local offices, who is the best point of contact to reach out to, to make that initial ask, Randy, of saying like, we're a resettlement agency in the community and um, and we recognize perhaps um, whether it's the assets that the college has that could offer a welcome to the newcomer or just recognizing that they're trying to diversify sponsors involved in this work or recognizing the advocacy power that young people have right now and the platform that they have. How do we engage your campuses and who's the person at the college to ask? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. So we do have three minutes. I do want one minute at the end to share some resources. Randy, can you answer that question very quickly? Yeah, there's not a magic <laughs> answer, unfortunately. Um, you know, it, it, it really depends on who's, uh, which, which campus. Um, we've been in contact with probably 30, 40 campuses as, as uh, Dia is, you know, they're all doing it a little bit differently. Um, sometimes it's run out of a president's office. In our case, it's the, uh, the School of Global Studies. Unfortunately, there's not really a good contact. Probably the best thing to do, do though is contact the, the university's uh, media office because they're the ones who know what everybody else is doing or they should. So if you were to contact the media outreach and say, hey, who's interested in this, even if it's not media related, they probably have the best idea of anybody who to contact. Thank you, Randy. And Shelly and, and Neely, if you have an answer to that question, would you put it in the chat um, to, so that Stacy can hear it and others can hear it? So I just wanted to flag some resources. Thank you so much to Neela, Shelly and Randy and Natalie for hosting us. Um, there's a, a wonderful event happening at Russell Sage that's open to the public in Boston on April 21st. We're going to send an email with these resources to folks who are on the call. Um, Every Campus Refuge and NASH uh, have developed a training. It's a free certificate bearing training to higher education institutions called Created Inclusive Communities Together, Transforming Higher Education Through Refugee Integration. It's an eight hour training that's open to colleges and universities, as I said, for free, and it's virtual. Um, Ashley will drop a link in the chat so that you can register for that. Um, it really is built to enrich your knowledge, empower you to see the possibilities for becoming a resettlement campus and equipping you with the tools to create such a campus. Um, this is, uh, sorry, the event at Russell Sage, and we'll share some information about that. Guilford also has a certificate bearing training for community members that you can register for. It's a three-day a uh, certificate um, that you can take virtually or on Guilford College's campus, and it's focused on community members, not higher education. Um, ECAR has a funding opportunity for campuses on the call who are interested in becoming an ECAR campus. You can apply for up to $10,000 from ECAR to support your efforts to become an ECAR campus. Um, and we have a funding opportunity for SUNY campuses specifically. So if you're a SUNY campus or know a SUNY campus, uh, State University of New York, campus, uh, please share this with them. Ashley's going to drop all of these links in the chat. Um, and finally, we have a migration summit uh, session coming up with many of the people on this call on April 12th and 27th. So please sign up for that to hear more about how we plan to empower refugee students. And here's a picture of the I Belong in Albany book. It's um, wonderful. Um, and finally, here are some organizations in this space that support this work, the President's Alliance, APLU, RRI, Welcome.us. Um, you, you are not alone if you're uh, doing um, this work. It was a pleasure being with you all today. Uh, we are at time. Um, thank you to everybody for attending, and we will see you in another space soon one day. Thank you. Thank you all so much and thank you for being here to present and I really appreciate all of this. Um, and again, we'll share all of this information with folks who registered. So feel free to reach out with questions once we do that. Thank you all. Thank you.